SpaceX has never faced a setback this serious. The explosion of Ship 36 and the damage at Massey hit them with a multi-billion dollar blow. Now, there's a real chance Flight 10 won't launch until the end of the year. But, despite the chaos, SpaceX isn't slowing down. In fact, their bold recent moves suggest they've got major plans for the next flight, aiming to get the program back on track fast. So, what exactly are those changes, and how does SpaceX plan to make Flight 10 happen? Let's break down in today's episode of Alpha Tech. SpaceX workers are sweating it out right now, racing to clear the wreckage at the Massey site and rebuild the entire facility after last week's devastating incident. Massive cranes are already in action, lifting twisted metal, fuel pipes, and torn apart rocket parts, some weighing tens of tons, scattered all over the site. This first wave of cleanup is clearing the way for a much larger rebuild effort in the coming weeks. The situation has stabilized, and despite the severe damage, SpaceX is pushing hard to get Massey back online fast, all in preparation for the upcoming Starship Flight 10. But the real question is, what's SpaceX really going to do to prepare for Starship Flight 10? Right now, the first step is figuring out which ship can take the place of the unlucky Ship 36. And honestly, there's no better candidate than the one parked right above it, Ship 37. This vehicle is the fifth prototype in the second stage Starship Block 2 series. It was built between March and April, and on May 29th, it was rolled out to the Massey site for cryogenic testing. A few days later, on June 4th, it returned to Mega Bay 2, with good news in tow. It had passed the cryo test with flying colors, a key milestone showing it can withstand the crushing pressures and freezing temps of flight. At this point, Ship 37 is said to be in its final prep phase. Engines are being installed, heat shield tiles are going on, and if everything stays on track, it should be fully outfitted in just a week or two. But here's the kicker. How can they run a static test when the Massey facility is still shut down? Some voices in the community say SpaceX should consider skipping the static fire altogether for Ship 37. Others argue that doing so would be far too risky. It might sound bold, even reckless to some, but given the current situation, it's a move that's actually worth considering. If they decide to launch Ship 37 without the static fire, they at least have a shot at completing their 10th flight without having to wait for Massey to get back online, a delay that could potentially stall the entire program for months, which is a huge deal when SpaceX is racing to get Starship operational. Keep in mind, Ship 28 and Ship 35 both flew without a static fire after their RVAC engine swap. So, this isn't uncharted territory. Sure, each instance comes with its own set of risks, but when everything is at a tipping point, maybe taking a little risk to keep the momentum is exactly what SpaceX needs. So, what do you think? Agree with skipping the static test for Ship 37? If you do, drop a comment with the number 1. If not, comment with the number 2. Some have suggested that SpaceX could bring back the old test stands they once used for Starship. After all, in the early days, SpaceX built and used several static fire stands for prototypes like SN5, SN8, and others. But here's the catch. Many of those early test stands have already been dismantled and are now sitting in storage inside the Star Factory. Over time, SpaceX shifted focus toward optimizing their infrastructure for faster, more frequent testing. So reusing those old test stands for Ship 37 and the upcoming Flight 10 isn't really a practical option. And let's not forget, static fire tests also need support from things like QD systems and propellant lines connected to a nearby tank farm. Without that full setup, those old test stands just won't cut it. That's why, at this point, the more realistic option is to run the static fire directly at Launch Pad A. The problem is, Launch Pad A was originally designed for integrated launches, Starship stacked on top of Super Heavy, not for standalone upper stage static fires. Still, its current infrastructure is far more complete than anything at Massey. It already has a functioning tank farm, water deluge system, and the orbital launch mount to anchor the vehicle during engine ignition. Massey may have been optimized for these kinds of tests, but Pad A is what's available though it might still lack some specialized hardware or require modifications to be fully up to the job. And here's the real risk. Using a launch pad for something it wasn't built for always comes with consequences. SpaceX is already under pressure after a string of failures, 
Flight 7, 8, 9, and now the Ship 36 explosion. If something were to go wrong at Launch Pad A, it could knock out orbital launch operations for the rest of the year. That would be a far bigger blow than the damage at Massey. So, yes, using Pad A is still on the table. But given the circumstances, skipping the static fire altogether might just be the smartest move. That covers the plan for Ship 37, but what about its booster? As of now, Booster 16 remains the chosen first stage for Flight 10. The Ship 36 incident had nothing to do with it, which is a relief. And honestly, it's lucky the explosion happened at the test site, not after the vehicle had been fully stacked on Launch Pad A's OLM. If that were the case, the damage would have been far worse. Booster 16 has already gone through its major checkouts, including a full-duration static fire test, back on June 6th. Then, on June 20th, the hot staging ring was removed while B-16 was inside Mega Bay 1. After that, the booster was rolled back into storage at Star Factory, awaiting the next steps. If SpaceX chooses to skip static fire for Ship 37, Booster 16 could be rolled out to the pad almost right away, and a July launch is still possible. But if they take the safer path, waiting until Massey is fully back online, we're probably looking at August or even September. That said, there's not much reason to worry. SpaceX has a history of bouncing back fast. After the Falcon 9 explosion at SLC-40, it took them about a year to rebuild. But Massey? It's a much more accessible site, making it easier and faster to bring in replacement parts and equipment which is why recovery could take as little as two months. And as always, SpaceX tends to treat failures as chances to learn. They tweak the systems, refine the process, and come back stronger. So, what's the best move SpaceX can make to keep Starship Flight 10 on track? The truth is, there's no perfect option on the table right now. If SpaceX chooses the faster route, they save time, but take on more risk. On the other hand, if they go with the slower, more methodical approach, the trade-off is clear. They lose momentum. And that's a big deal, especially with Elon Musk promising that Starship Block 3 will debut later this year, followed by a demo flight of the orbital refilling system sometime next year. The next step for SpaceX is clear. Figure out exactly what caused the explosion. If it turns out to be a failed COPV tank, then it's likely a straightforward fix. But if the root cause lies in a fundamental design flaw within Starship Block 2, then things get a lot more serious. In that case, Ship 37 won't just be the next vehicle in line, it'll serve as a crucial test to determine whether the same issue exists in other units. That would also make a static fire test almost unavoidable. Still, the primary objective of Starship Flight 10 remains the same. Gather more flight data and complete a few key tasks that Flight 9 couldn't. One of those is deploying the Starlink simulators, a mission goal that failed last time when the payload bay door didn't open. Another critical item is addressing the fuel tank depressurization issue. SpaceX will be looking to pinpoint exactly where the leak originated so they can apply those lessons to the upcoming Block 3 design. And beyond the vehicle itself, there's the Massey test site. Rebuilding that facility is now a top priority, but more than that, SpaceX may need to construct a second test complex to avoid future bottlenecks. It's a necessary move if they want to reach Elon Musk's vision of building up to 1,000 starships per year, a pace that simply isn't possible with a single testing site. And finally, this could also be the moment SpaceX starts shifting focus toward the next evolution of the vehicle, Starship FAM-3. At first glance, rebuilding the existing test systems sounds like a logical move. It would allow SpaceX to continue testing and flying the remaining V2 prototypes, including boosters 15, 16, and 17, as well as ships 37, 38, and 39. These vehicles are still flight-worthy and waiting for their turn. Restoring the current infrastructure to support them might be the fastest way to get Starship flying again. Now, let's shift gears to a surprising new development. While SpaceX is facing some setbacks, another player is quietly making moves in the world of reusable rockets. And it's not who you'd expect. We're talking about Honda, the automotive giant best known for cars and motorcycles, now turning its sights towards space. Just last week, Honda R&D surprised everyone by conducting a launch and landing test of a reusable rocket prototype, something no one even knew existed. 
This small test vehicle stands about 20 feet tall, or 6.3 meters, and weighs around 1.3 tons when fully fueled. In a rather unexpected move, they launched it to an altitude of roughly 270 meters, nearly 900 feet. There's still no official word on the propellant used, but judging by the exhaust plume, it looks like a cryogenic fuel, possibly liquid methane and oxygen, just like SpaceX's Starship. This was their first full launch and landing test, clearly aimed at proving reusability, and it went surprisingly well. The vehicle showed excellent stability during both ascent and descent, and they even nailed the landing using four deployable legs, very similar to Falcon 9. The landing appeared to hit almost dead center, which is genuinely impressive. Although this news caught many by surprise, Honda actually began seriously pursuing rocketry back in 2021 when it announced plans to develop a reusable rocket, along with other ambitious space innovations, including what they call a renewable energy circulation system for the lunar surface. Since then, the company has reached a key milestone in rocket reusability. The company aims to launch a suborbital vehicle by 2029, although the project is still in its early research phase. Now, Honda hasn't announced any formal plans to commercialize this kind of vehicle, but the test clearly proves they're not just playing around. And with a heavyweight like Honda stepping in, alongside Blue Origin and rising Chinese startups, SpaceX now has real competition to watch. That kind of pressure could push them to innovate faster and cut costs even more. Because in this new era of spaceflight, the race isn't slowing down. It's only just getting started.